Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, our major topic is uh, transport in animals, and we are going to discuss the subtopic structure and functions of blood. First of all, we need to know what blood is. Blood is the liquid, is the liquid in which materials are transported. So that means that the major function of uh, blood is uh, transport. And remember what we are discussing is mainly what happens in mammals and uh, the best example is the human, human beings, human beings. Now, what are the major functions of blood? So, major functions of, of blood are, one, it is a medium of transport medium of transport of materials of uh, materials to and from other tissues to and from other tissues e.g. glucose is transported to the tissues uh, while carbon four oxide that is CO2 is transported from tissues what we mean here is that these substances or materials that is the glucose is required in the tissues for the process of respiration to take place, while carbon four oxide, after respiration has taken place, is produced, and it must be taken away from the tissues for elimination from the body. So both of those, which are just two examples, will be taken either to the tissues or away from the tissues. The second major function of blood is regulation of body temperature, regulation of body temperature, which is known as thermoregulation, thermoregulation. Remember that mammals have got a constant body temperature. For example, in human beings, the normal body temperature is on average 36.5 degrees Celsius. For that temperature to remain constant, the activities that take place in the body that ensure that the body temperature is maintained at a constant. Uh, this will be discussed in later topics. And number three, which is the other major uh, function of uh, body, is uh, protection against disease causing microorganisms, disease causing microorganisms, which are also known as uh, microbes or pathogens, or pathogens. So the body has a mechanism of ensuring that these microorganisms like viruses, e.g. the one that is now bringing a lot of problems, corona, are cleared from the body through a defense mechanism that is in the body. We also have some bacteria, bacteria like the one that causes a cholera known as Vibrio cholerae. And we also have microscopic microscopic fungi, all these, for example, a good example of microscopic fungi is uh, yeast. 
uh, all these are cleared from the body by antibodies that are found in the blood. So again, that's a topic that will be discussed later. Then, how much blood is found in human beings? An average human being, that is a, an average, that is a medium-sized human being who is not underweight or obese, has got five to six liters of blood. So that is about the volume of the blood that is found in uh, human beings, five to six liters of blood. And this is about 10% of body weight of uh, an adult, body weight of an adult. So if you are 90 kilograms, about nine kilograms will be the blood that is circulating in your circulatory system. So after we discuss that, we now need to know what do we find in blood. So we have composition of composition of blood. What do we find in blood? The, the blood is composed of two major, two major uh, components. The first component is what we call the cellular component. And the other component is the plasma, or what we call blood plasma. So what do we have in the cellular component? We have the red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes. Known as erythrocytes, we have the white blood cells. So white blood cells are also known as the leukocytes. And we have the, the blood platelets, which are also known as thrombocytes. Those, those, uh, those components make up the cellular components of the blood. We are going to discuss the red blood cells in details, white blood cells in details, and the blood platelets in details, and the function of each. The blood plasma is the liquid part of the blood, is the liquid part of the blood. So we are going to start with the, the blood plasma. Blood plasma. What is blood plasma? Blood plasma is a fluid that is yellow in color. It is uh, yellow in color, and it accounts for 55% of <coughs> total volume of blood. So 55% of uh, total volume of blood. So this yellow fluid is about 55% of the total volume of, <coughs> of uh, blood. And 90%, 90% of blood plasma, of blood plasma is water. So what about the next 10%? 10% is made up of, made up of uh, dissolved food, Dissolved substances. Dissolved substances. And these substances dissolve in the water that is found in blood uh, plasma. So which are these substances that are found in plasma? So substances found in, in plasma, and remember, these substances are in solution form because they have already dissolved in the water. So, which are they? One, 
we can ha uh, have A, food nutrients. For example, we have glucose, we have amino acids, we have fatty acids, and glycerol. Glucose comes from the digestion of carbohydrates. After carbohydrates were digested <coughs> in the alimentary canal, glucose was formed, which was absorbed into the bloodstream. And it is now this glucose that is found in plasma. After proteins were digested, the end products are amino acids, which are again absorbed in the ileum, and they are the ones that are now found in plasma. And the fatty acids and the glycerol come from uh, digestion of lipids or fats. So after they were digested, they were absorbed into the lactyl and taken through the lymphatic system and eventually they join the blood circulation. So, but some, not all the glucose, not all the amino acids, not all the fatty acids that were formed are found in plasma. Some were used in other processes like respiration for glucose, amino acids. Some of them were used to form other proteins which are required in the body. Fatty acids, the excess could, well, could have been stored under the skin and the others could have also been used for respiration in case we have less glucose. Then the other substance that is uh, found are the metabolic waste products. Metabolic waste products, for example, uh, carbon-4 oxide and nitrogenous waste products. Nitrogenous waste products, a good example is urea which must be taken from the body tissues and be eliminated through the organs that excrete them. For example, carbon dioxide is excreted in the lungs, while most of the urea is excreted in the kidneys. Then the other substance that we find are the hormones. Examples of hormones are insulin, glucagon and adrenaline. All of these hormones, after hormones are produced, they are taken into the bloodstream. Now we know that the hormones dissolve in the water, in the plasma, and are taken to where they are required. Where they are required is known as their target organs. For example, the target organ of insulin and glucagon is the, the liver, is the liver. While the adrenaline, the target is the muscle cells, muscle cells. So those are their target organs. Then we have uh, enzymes, enzymes. Which enzymes do we find in the blood plasma? They are mainly the extracellular enzymes. Extracellular enzymes. Just to remind ourselves, extracellular enzymes are produced in cells, then they are taken out of the cells to where they are required. For example, the digestive, digestive enzymes are produced in glands, then they are taken out. Some of them may dissolve in the plasma. And we also have antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that are required for the protection of the body. We will discuss them uh, in details uh, later. 
So antibodies are usually produced when there is an infection in the body to fight, uh, to clear the pathogens or what we call disease causing microorganisms or the microbes. So those are the main substances that are found dissolved in the blood plasma. Now, <clears throat> sometimes it is possible to remove some components of uh, plasma, of uh, blood plasma, and a good example is this, that fibrinogen can be removed from blood plasma. So if you have blood, you have blood from which fibrinogen, which is one of the proteins that are found in plasma, is removed, then what is left is not known as blood plasma, but it is known as serum. Serum. So ser uh, serum is blood plasma from which fibrinogen has been removed. So we will come across fibrinogen when we discuss the blood platelets or the thrombocytes because it is involved in blood clotting. Okay. What are the functions of the blood plasma? There are so many functions of the blood plasma, but we will discuss the major ones. Actually, the major functions of uh, major functions of blood plasma is one transport and the other one is protection against protection against the pathogens i hope we remember what pathogens are so protection against pathogens and also thermoregulation and thermoregulation thermoregulation is the regulation of the blood of a constant body temperature so mainly the blood plasma is involved in transport of substances and thermoregulation protection remember comes after there is an infection so which are the major functions one so remember we said mainly transport so there is a transport of the red blood cells that contain which contain oxygen which contain oxygen and these red blood cells are transported to the tissues and okay or carbon four oxide from tissues Red blood cells, white blood cells, blood platelets cannot be moved from one point of the body to the other without having that medium of transport, which is the blood plasma. So after the red blood cells are produced, wherever they are, where they are produced, the red, white blood cells and uh, platelets, they are now released into the blood from where they will be carried. So red blood cells combine with the oxygen to form what we call oxyhemoglobin, which we are going to discuss later. And this is now taken to the tissues. As the hemoglobin comes from the tissues, it can carry some carbon four oxide. So plasma is involved in transport of red blood cells. The other function is, uh, again, transport. 
of metabolic waste products, transport of metabolic waste products. And we mentioned some metabolic waste products here, which are carbon-4 oxide and nitrogenous waste products, for example, urea. So they will be taken away from the tissues. Three, we have the, the hormones that we mentioned. So blood plasma is also involved in transport of hormones. So the hormones that we mentioned, insulin, glucagon, adrenaline, and many others, after they are produced, they are released into the bloodstream and they are taken to their target organs. After reaching their target organs, their effect is now felt. For example, insulin taken to the after it reaches the liver, then uh, there will be activities that will take place due to its presence, which is again a topic for the last topic in this series, that is form two. And also adrenaline, whose uh, target organ is mainly the muscle cells. Uh, we also have transport of uh, transport of uh, mineral ions. Mm -hmm. After the salts were taken in, they dissolve in the body to form mineral ions. So these mineral ions, a good example, are the chloride ions, written like that, and sodium ions, like that. All these are required in the body, so they will be moved around, dissolved in the water, in the blood plasma. Then we have another function, that is the transport of antigens and antibodies, and antibodies to where they are required, that is at required sites. Okay, not all, ant uh, usually antigens cause diseases or infections, but not all of them are bad. We are going again towards the head, see how important some antigens are. Because some antigens are important in giving us or determining the blood group. Some antigens are also required in the body, for example, in vaccines. So once a person is uh, injected with the weakened antigens, they are taken into the blood plasma and taken to required sites. And if it is for vaccination, they will be moving around the body until when they come across the real antigen that may cause the disease. Antibodies are produced due to presence of uh, infection and they are taken from one point to the other as uh, in blood plasma. Then we have got the other one, which is the distribution of heat. Distribution of heat. And remember we mentioned thermal regulation. Thermal regulation. So there's distribution of heat from organs, e.g. the liver. The liver produces a lot of uh, energy, uh, a lot of uh, heat energy, and most of this heat energy is distributed around the body, from the liver to all parts of the body, so that eventually we can maintain the required body temperature, that is thermal regulation. <coughs> and uh, the liver cells produce a lot of heat and also the muscle cells, mainly the skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles are the muscles that are found attached to the skeleton. Sometimes when it is cold, you shiver so that some heat is produced. When it is cold, the liver produces a lot of heat 
and all this is taken to all parts of the body to maintain constant body temperature. We also mentioned the protection. Protection is here, number five. Of uh, you remember we have the um, antibodies. So that marks the blood plasma. We have mentioned what uh, what makes up the blood plasma, the water, the dissolved substances, and the examples of the dissolved substances. And we have also given the major functions of blood plasma. So now we are ready to discuss the other component of blood and those are the cellular components. So this will be number two. cellular components. So which are these uh, cellular components? So these are the blood cells, <coughs> blood cells, and which are they? We have one, the red blood cells, which are also known as erythrocytes sites. We have a white blood cells which are known as leukocytes. We have the blood platelets which are known as drobocytes. Drobocytes. So we will be discussing each of them, description of red blood cells and their functions and adaptations, the white blood cells, again, their functions and where they are produced, the blood platelets and the all in the body. So we start with the first one, which is the red blood cells which we have now know that they are also known as erythrocytes. <clears throat> How do the red blood cells appear? They are like discs. They are actually round. They are round in shape, like that. So they are disc-shaped. And what happens is that at the center, they are depressed towards the inside. So on both sides, it is depressed from uh, the one side and the other side. So that at the center, it is a bit depressed as compared to the edges. That is, if you look at the red blood cell from the side, it will appear like this. It will have this shape. That shape. So this is the depressed center. So, like that, depression them. Such a shape is said to be biconcave. Biconcave, bi. That is the two sides, concave, depressed towards the center. So, we can comfortably say that the red blood cells are disc shaped and uh, they are red. The reason why they are called red blood cells is that their color is red and it is because they contain the red pigment known as hemoglobin. So the red blood cells contain the red pigment known as uh, hemoglobin which is important in uh, transport of oxygen. We are going to see how. Then we have said that they are biconcave in shape, 
meaning that <coughs> in the center at the center they are thinner than uh, around the edges so around the edges they are wider or thicker than at the center and that gives this shape which we have called biconcave shape where are they formed the red blood cells are formed that is uh, in adults in adults they are formed in the bone marrow of short bones <coughs> are formed in the bone marrow of short bones examples of uh, short bones just a few examples the ribs which are found in this region that's where the, the ribs are found we have another short bone known as the sternum sternum is the bone from this point of the neck to where the ribs head it's known as the sternum it attaches the ribs on the ventral side or towards the front then at the back of the body we have what we call vertebrae vertebrae is the plural for vertebra is the plural for vert vertebra so vertebra is the singular so what are vertebrae these are series of bones that are found from the base of the neck to the last point of the vertebral column so it is a um, system of short bones each we have uh, each of uh, some of them found in the neck region others in the abdominal region and um, others in the thoracic region so all those bones combined are known as vertebrae and they are short bones so those are just the three examples where the red blood cells are formed in adults so bone marrow of short bones those are the ribs sternum and uh, the vertebrae what about in abuse the uh, red blood cells are also formed but now in the abuse in two organs this is the in the liver and spleen the abuse do not have fully formed bones yet they need oxygen so the red blood cells will still be formed but again in the liver and the spleen after they are born after some time the role will be taken over by the bone marrow of short bone so here what we mean by adults not what we know as uh, adults from age 18 from age 16 no it is actually after they are born by the time they are approaching one year age they will have they all will have already been taken by the bone marrow of short bones or even earlier then uh, the red blood cells are unique and they are unique so that they carry enough oxygen to the tissues because we need a lot of oxygen in our bodies for the process of respiration and other processes that require oxygen so what happens is that uh, after the red blood cells are formed and they reach maturity that is uh, they mature a few changes take place in them and one of them is that the mature red blood cells will lack nucleus they don't have nucleus and other organelles and some other organelles e.g for example mitochondria mitochondria now remember this a nucleus the role of the nucleus 
is to control all the activities of a cell. So if a nucleus is removed from a cell, that cell will die. Remember, mitochondria are the sites of uh, energy formation, sites of respiration. So again, each cell requires energy. So if we do not have mitochondria, then this cell will eventually die due to lack of energy. And this is the reason why the red blood cells have a short lifespan. They, they exist in the system for a period of, they have a, a period of 120 days. So they have a short life span and this is about 100 to 120 days. So by the end of the 100 or the 120th day, the red blood cells will have died and they will have disintegrated. So what happens to these old and worn out cells? Old worn out red blood cells uh, will be broken down so where they are destroyed are destroyed in the spleen mainly in the spleen uh, some of them are destroyed in the liver and the lymph nodes lymph nodes are found in the body some are found in the neck region others in the groin region. So that is where the old and worn out red blood cells are destroyed. And what happens is that hemoglobin, hemoglobin is a protein. And this protein contains iron. It's a protein that contains a non-protein known as iron. And this is an example of what we call conjugated, conjugated protein, conjugated protein. So what will happen is that after the red blood cells are destroyed, the iron component will not be destroyed. Rather, it is going to be recycled. It's going to be recycled and it is uh, going to be used for formation of used to, uh, for formation of more red blood cells so th th that is uh, what happens so how many red blood cells does one have the number will vary but on average an adult will have about 5 million of red blood cells uh, 5 million of red blood cells in 1 millicubic millimeter of blood so if you take 1 millimeter cubed of blood you are going to have 5 million red blood cells but again the number of red blood cells may vary depending on two main factors. So which are the factors that determine the number of red blood cells? So <clears throat> we are saying that the number of red blood cells may vary depending on one altitude altitude is the height above sea level and what happens is at higher altitude we have got a lower concentration of oxygen. So the body will respond 
by producing more uh, red blood cells. We are going to discuss that one in uh, details uh, shortly. So at high altitude, we have got so more red blood cells. That means that the higher the altitude, the more the number of red blood cells. The other one definitely is the health status. Health status. Uh, if one is sick, then what happens is that mainly the red blood cells are going to reduce. A good example is people who have severe anemia. People with severe anemia, these are people you'll find with pale nails because their blood cells will have uh, reduced in number. So severe anemic people will have less blood cells. And also people who have severe malaria. So these are the two areas or two cases where people will have fewer red blood cells. So severe anemia will mean that these people will have abnormal red blood cells. And the ones they have which are normal will be less. People with severe malaria will also have fewer red blood cells because uh, what happens is that the malaria parasites attacks the red blood cells and this will kill them. So, at higher altitude, a person will have more than 5 million red blood cells in one cubic millimeter of blood. If somebody is sick, from severe anemia or severe malaria, they are going to have less than this number. That is 5 million of red blood cells in one cubic millimeter of blood. Uh, before we discuss the functions of the red blood cells, it is important because we said that uh, the red blood cells or the erythrocytes have to, must have some structures or structural modifications that enable them carry enough oxygen. So we are going to discuss the adaptations of the red blood cells. So adaptations of red blood cells. There are quite many and we are going to discuss the major ones. One they have a biconcave shape. That is the modification. Remember for adaptations, we mentioned the modification and the significance of that modification. So they have a biconcave shape and this ensures that this increases surface area <coughs> over which oxygen and carbon for oxide are diffused or transported. So by concave shape, remember, depressed at the center, the depression increases the surface over which diffusion will be taking place of uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. That means that dead blood cells will actually be involved in transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Then the other one which we have said is that they have no nucleus. A red blood cell will have no nucleus. And what does that mean? 
the space that would have been occupied by the nucleus is now occupied and it is nucleus and those other organelles actually though that space will now be occupied by hemoglobin so lack of nucleus increases to, uh, so this is uh, to increase <coughs> space for hemoglobin packaging hemoglobin packaging so not packing but packaging so more hemoglobin will be found in a cell that it does not have nucleus nucleus is very large it takes up most of the space of the cell so you remove it you increase more uh, hemoglobin molecules uh, the other one is the process in the presence of hemoglobin so they have hemoglobin <coughs> hemoglobin uh, and this hemoglobin has a high affinity has a high affinity for oxygen so hemoglobin is a red pigment that is uh, involved in transport of uh, oxygen so uh, hemoglobin is a red pigment and that is what makes the red blood cells to have the red color and uh, what happens is that it combines with oxygen and high affinity means that hemoglobin attracts a lot of oxygen it increases the rate at which it will combine with oxygen to form of the hemoglobin which is uh, taken to the tissues for oxygen to be offloaded or released then we have <coughs> the plasma membrane is pliable so we say that they are pliable another name for pliability is flexibility so red blood cells are pliable or we say that they are flexible why to enable them is uh, to enable them squeeze through capillaries so to enable them squeeze through capillaries there's something that we need to remember here that the capillary is very narrow the red blood cell might be large so what happens is that once they come into the capillaries due to the force of the force of the blood forces the red blood cells into the capillaries but what happens is that their shape may change without breaking so that the red blood cell can now fit in the capillaries and uh, it will be taken to where they are required remember exchange of materials take place in the capillaries which we have already discussed i hope we remember this information there's another adaptation of uh, red blood cells the red blood cells contain an enzyme that is known as carbonic anhydrase so they contain carbonic carbonic anhydrase enzyme carbonic anhydrase enzyme enable or facilitates transport of transport of carbon for oxide so contain carbonic anhydrase enzyme uh, to enable or sorry, 
to enable transport of carbon dioxide. Again, shortly, we are going to see how carbonic anhydrous facilitates uh, transport of carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs, where it is removed from the body. Uh, there is another <coughs> adaptation, and that is they have a very thin plasma membrane. Thin plasma membrane, or what we call another name for plasma membrane, is a cell membrane or plasma lemma. So the thin plasma membrane ensures that. Uh, the distance of diffusion is reduced. So to reduce distance of diffusion of the gases. And these gases are mainly oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the gases are oxygen and carbon four. <laughs> uh, we still have another adaptation. That's number seven. Note here, adaptations of red blood cells. So this is in the plural. So, and remember the number. They are about five million in one millimeter cubed of blood. So we can say that they are numerous. They are numerous. And this is uh, to increase amount of oxygen and carbon for oxide <coughs> transported. Of course, the higher the number of red blood cells, the more oxygen and the carbon for oxide will be transported. However, this adaptation is for the plural. When we have, if a question is explain or discuss adaptations of red blood cells, we can mention number seven. But if the requirement is you explain or describe or state adaptations of red blood cell, it means one cell. So you cannot mention number seven, which means that they will be more than, uh, they, they, they are only, it's only one, so you do not give the, the plural. So those are the adaptations of uh, <coughs> red blood cells. And now the next is on the functions of red blood cells. So functions of red blood cells. Remember, we say that there are areas that will be required to be discussed <coughs> for each of the cells. So we have the red blood cells. We have discussed where they are formed. We have discussed the adaptations and now the uh, functions. So number one is uh, transport of oxygen. So 
uh, transport of oxygen. Now, this is the major function of uh, red blood cells, and that is uh, transport of oxygen. So, we are going to discuss several aspects of this transport that are involved in uh, oxygen transportation to the tissues. So, uh, transport of oxygen is the major function of uh, red blood cells. And how is it uh, carried out? One is that uh, <coughs> the red blood cells, <coughs> red blood cells transport oxygen from the lungs Uh, red blood cells transport oxygen from the lungs to the tissues. And we can talk of to the other tissues because remember blood is a tissue. So we cannot take oxygen to the blood. So it is uh, mainly red blood cells will transport oxygen from the lungs to those other tissues other than uh, the blood itself. So. We mentioned the red pigment, which is known as uh, hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is important because as blood passes in the lungs, hemoglobin will combine with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin is an unstable compound. Mm -hmm. It is unstable, and that means that it dissociates very easily when it reaches the tissues. So <clears throat> here, as blood passes, as blood passes in the lungs, as blood passes in the lungs, uh, hemoglobin, hemoglobin combines with oxygen to form the unstable oxygen hemoglobin to form the unstable oxygen hemoglobin <coughs> and remember the reason why this is happening is because hemoglobin has got a very high affinity for oxygen. So it combines easily with uh, oxygen. Now, this blood now will move from the lungs to other parts of the body or to those other tissues of the body. So when this blood, so when the blood containing oxyhemoglobin, uh -huh. the blood containing oxyhemoglobin reaches the tissues or reaches low oxygen concentration areas, e.g. other tissues, uh -huh. oxyhemoglobin the hemoglobin dissociates to release oxygen to the tissues to the tissues and this leaves hemoglobin free so the free hemoglobin is taken back to the lungs to pick more oxygen to pick more oxygen from the lungs of course from the lungs 
So the process through which uh, ox uh, oxyhemoglobin dissociates to release oxygen is known as offloading. So we say that in the tissues, oxygen is uh, offloaded. So. next equation Nikimaliza equation ni stop. So the equation of what happens here in the lungs and in the tissues can be summarized in this equation. So hemoglobin plus oxygen, this takes place in the lungs. And the compound formed is known as oxyhemoglobin. In the tissues, oxyhemoglobin breaks down, sorry, dissociates, it doesn't break down, it dissociates into hemoglobin that is free to pick more oxygen and oxygen is released so that it can now get into the tissues. So this happens in the tissues. So <clears throat> that uh, summarizes what happens in the lungs and what happens in the tissues. We will stop there, but we will continue with the functions of the red blood cells later. Time will not allow us to continue more. Thank you.